Thank you very much for coming, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here again. I haven't been to this conference for a few years, but it's always nice to come back to Malmo. Um, and, of course, Copenhagen. Um, today, I wanted to talk to you about um, how we could build uh, microservices using really streaming systems. Uh, so my name is Ben Stopford. I work uh, at Confluent. Confluent is the company, or one of the companies, I should say, that sits behind Apache Kafka. Uh, Apache Kafka is a kind of streaming platform, or many people think of, uh, think of it really as this messaging system, but it's really something slightly richer than that. Um, anyone heard of Confluent? Yeah, we've got a few. Great. That's awesome. So um, this talks really about two different, pretty different concepts, and hopefully I'm going to be able to introduce these concepts in a way that makes them seem pretty different, but are actually quite closely related. So the first is this idea of event-driven architectures, or maybe event sourcing. Um, and the other one, that's really about how we build business systems. And the other one is stream processing, which is how we build these um, big uh, real-time analytics platforms, particularly at some of the bigger internet companies. And it turns out that a lot of the tools which are developed to use to, to, do, to build um, streaming systems can be reapplied to build um, uh, business systems. Particularly now, um, these systems have, the streaming systems have um, good notions of things like correctness. So if, if we start at sort of the beginning, um, we have to start with the concept of an event. And an event is kind of a simple thing, you know? It's just like a fact. It's like some observation about the world. So that might be a payment, or it might be some user viewing a, a, a page on your website. Um, it might be a line of logging inside um, uh, that's being output by your system, or maybe a sensor reading. So well, each of these things is effectively an event, and an event has um, a few interesting properties. So one property is that we can actually use this concept of event sourcing. And when we source our, our data as events, rather than using a traditional model as we might in a database, we get a slightly different type of system. So on the right-hand side, we have um, a shopping basket represented in a database. This is how you think about a shopping basket. It's actually how a user thinks about a shopping basket. We have Bob's got a pair of trousers, he's got a, a jumper, and he's got a hat. Um, if we were to represent that in an event-sourced way, we would actually record a bit more information. We would actually record the journey that Bob went through to actually build up his shopping basket. So it actually turns out Bob added two pairs of trousers originally on the left-hand side. He then added a jumper. Uh, he then realized that he didn't really want two pairs of trousers because no one needs two pairs of the same type of trousers. Uh, so he removed one of them, and then he added a hat, and then he decided to check out. So this event source view, which is literally composed of the various different events, allows us to observe the behavior of the system. So the behavior of the user, behavior of the system, et cetera. And we can obviously derive one from the other. So we can derive this stateful view that we might, we might typically associate with a, a database, that notion of mutable state, uh, using a stream processor. And there are various, various different techniques for doing this. Um, the other idea is, is this idea of an event-driven system. So let's say we can use events not just as a mechanism for storing information, but also for driving processing. So we might have an application that subscribes to a, a single stream of events. In this case, enriches it in some way using a database and sends out an email. In a streaming system, we actually do something. We can do um, some slightly richer properties. So we can actually deal with many different streams at the same time. We can also do operations that work on multiple events. So rather than just going one event at a time, we can actually introspect the whole stream and build up kind of more complicated operations. So the, 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 these systems actually come from um, the world of big data. Um, so this is a pretty good example. So you probably have a phone in your pocket. Um, I have like an iPhone. Um, many of you will, will too. And these create some pretty big data sets. So every time you open an application, it sends a little message back to Apple saying that you opened you know, WhatsApp or Facebook. And likewise, if, that's, if one of those applications crashes, it sends another message back to Apple. And this is a pretty big data set, because there's like a billion iPhones in the world. So it's like 70 terabytes a day compressed or something like that. So you can land these data sets inside um, Kafka. Kafka is effectively a messaging system. It has a publish, subscribe semantic, um, quite similar to something like um, uh, ActiveMQ or, or Rabbit, that sort of thing, but just on, on a different level of scale. And then we can then process that information once it's landed um, inside this second layer, this stream processing layer. And then we push the data into a serving layer. 
And you might think, well, you could just solve this, these kind of, uh, you could sort of answer questions using a database. Uh, that would be an alternative approach to this. Um, the reason we tend to use streaming systems is that they're, they're more real time. They give us a result much more quickly. So if we ingest data into a database, we then have to basically trawl our way through that database. If it's a Hadoop platform, that's basically just a database that only does table scans. Um, so that can actually take quite a long time. So a streaming system gives us the advantage that we can get a result very quickly. Uh, the disadvantage is it has a fixed query. because it's, it's absolutely running some kind of query continuously. So you're effectively sort of stuck with the query that you chose. So these systems get pretty big. Um, Netflix run you know, 2.2 trillion messages a day, so that's about six petabytes of data. There are about 400 microservices per cluster. Um, they have different clusters for different use cases, ranging between 20 and 200 brokers. 200 brokers is like a pretty insane, insane use case. That's a massive amount of throughput. So let's just look at each of these little component, these components in a bit more detail. So Kafka itself, as I said, is a kind of messaging system. Um, it's not like traditional messaging systems. It's based on this concept of a distributed log. And a log is a very simple idea. It's like a file. So when you write messages to Kafka, what it does is it just appends those basically to the end of a file. It's actually a set of files spread across many different machines, but it's just appending that data to a file. And that's very efficient. It allows you to do sequential operations. It's O of 1 for write. When you read data from Kafka, you have a pointer. Actually, Kafka stores this pointer for you. It didn't in very early versions, but these days it does. So you have a pointer, and everyone else has a pointer. And you jump to a posi particular position in the file, and you just read those messages. And you get like a stream of messages sent to you. So this is actually O of 1 for read. So this very nice operation that works well in memory, it also works well on disk. And this means we can store very large data sets inside this. In fact, we can use Kafka as a storage system. Um, so if we want to store an entire data set, let's say we have maybe a, a set of customers or currency codes or something like that, we could put those inside a topic. Um, and then if we wanted to read the whole thing, we just set our pointer back to 0, and we replay. Now, notice that this isn't like a database. You can't query Kafka. It'll only give you a stream. It'll let you jump to different points, but it'll only give you a stream. You can't query by something like a key. So that's the, the buffering layer, which will ingest all these, these data, the data that's coming from mobile phones. The streaming layer is the thing that's going to do this continuous computation. Um, and here's an example. Um, so let's say this, this continuing that kind of uh, that, that example with the mobile phones. Let's say we want to work out whether or not different applications are behaving themselves. Like, are they becoming unstable? So we might define an unstable application as being one that crashes more than 5% of the time. If we'd represented that as a, in a streaming system, we'd actually have a set of different steps. And we chain those things together. And this is a programming model which is called data flow programming. So it's very similar to if, you, if you're familiar with Unix and you write, write, have, use maybe sed or orc or any actually kind of command where you pipe output from one process into another process. It's a very similar idea. You have like different functions, and they're going to basically pipe their output into a ne the next function, which is expecting that input. So at the top, we have a stream of applications being opened. So this is people opening apps on their phone. Uh, the bottom, app crashes, is there's applications that were crashing. And the first, the top and bottom operations would basically work out whether or not, uh, or, sorry, work out how many um, applications opened or applications crash crashed we have per day. And then they would pipe that information um, into this second stage, which would work out whether or not things, um, any of these applications are unstable. So effectively, just the ratio of one over, uh, over the other, and um, then compare that with whatever our threshold is, 5%. So to, to do this, um, you, the stream processor uses a few, few tools. So if we just take that, actually that top example, the applications open, we're just going to focus on that. We just want to work out how many applications were opened per day. So we have this like, concept of a one-day window. We'd have a stream coming in and of applications open, stream going out of applications per day. And we're going to have to maintain some state. The state turns out to be really important in stream processing because you're processing an event at a time, and you need to keep some information so that you can understand actually the behavior inside the whole stream of events. 
And actually, what you're going to create is, is something that's a bit like a table. So for each application, we're going to keep a count of how many events were, were opened in the last day. So WhatsApp has had 102 million, Facebook is 512 million, etc. And we store that. We can't just store it in a variable. We need to store that somewhere that's persistent, because we might fail. And if we fail and came back again and we lost our state, then our counts would all be wrong. Um, so we actually store that in a little thing called RocksDB. It's basically a disk resident hash table. And that data is actually backed up to Kafka. So you have this ability to basically write to a little database um, and keep maintain state as you're processing a stream in real time. So there are different ways to express this. I'm going to use KSQL, which is a, a, stream, uh, a SQL interface for the Kafka Streams API. The Kafka Streams API is a bit that actually ships with Apache Kafka. This is a, a confluent product. So there's a few things. Just to do this, this very simple example, um, there are a few things of note. The first thing is that even though we're actually outputting a stream, we, ri we, we're actually, we, we, we write create table. Because what we're creating is this little table with WhatsApp, Facebook. Twitter and all of the counts. The way we're going to interpret so that would actually be created inside the stream processor, and there would even be a copy of that in Kafka. But what we're actually going to um, use further down the chain is a change log of that, of that stream. What that just means is every time the ta table changes, you get a little update that says how the table changed. So then we're going to fall into something that looks a lot more like SQL, so we can collect, select the application ID and the count from apps opened, which is the input stream. We can have a one-day window. So we're only going to consider this computation over a period of one day. And that will basically roll forward, or actually tumble forward. And then we have to do a group by, because we're obviously grouping by each application, very similar to the way we would use SQL. And I, I tend to use KSQL and KStreams at different points in this talk. So just to say that they're, they're basically equivalent. One's a SQL interface for Kafka Streams. Kafka Streams is just a Java API, which you can use inside programs, microservices, et cetera. So that's a very simple example. Street streaming is actually much richer. It allows you to pull different streams in from different places, perform different types of computations on those streams, manage states, and then output some interesting result. So that was like a bit of an intro to stream processing. Let's talk a bit about event-driven architectures and how these tend to come up, particularly around things like microservices. So um, software systems obviously tend to grow. Um, you often start off with something monolithic on the left-hand side, and then maybe you distribute that out across many different processes, uh, but share a database. Later, you might decide to adopt microservices. That basically means, it means a few things, but it typically means having a separate database per service. So we've actually functionally decomposed our application into services which do specific things. Each one has its own database. And then where we tend to get into this event-driven model is when we want to actually separate things from the user interface. So um, let's say we have some processing process like logistics, where we're going to start uh, managing up the parcel flow between um, a user and the warehouse and, and getting stuff to their door. Or maybe we're doing fraud detection. Um, or maybe we're just doing something simple like billing. Any process which doesn't have to need to happen when a user is clicking a button, that's when we'll often start to build event-driven services. Because we want to decouple ourselves from that button click. We want to decouple ourselves from the front end. And we use the messaging system as a, basically a, an intermediary, a broker, which allows us to do that decoupling. And we do this with events. And events themselves have two important properties. The first is the first hat, as it were, um, is this notification hat. It's an event is something that drives action. But the second hat is that an event can also move data from one place to another. So inside the event is obviously some information. If I have an order event, the order information is inside the order. So if I take a stream of events and move them from, let's say, one database to another, I'm able to replicate data from one place to another. So let's take a simple example where we have um, a little online use case. We have a very simple web service uh, and uh, a web server which is talking to an order service and a customer service. Those are the two online services. And then in the middle, we have like a, um, an asynchronous service. So this is going to manage the shipping process, the logistics of getting your parcel to your door uh, once you buy a pair of trousers or whatever it might be. And this, in a REST-based model, you'd submit an order to the order service. You maybe updated your customer information in the customer service a couple of years ago. 
And that would make a call to the shipping service, and the shipping service would look up where to send your parcel and then manage that process for you. This is all very simple. If we add events, we can do a couple of interesting things. So firstly, we can decouple the shipping service using the message broker. So instead of the, ship, the order service looking up some service discovery tool and then um, calling the shipping service directly, it just creates an event. It doesn't know where it's going. It doesn't know who's using it. The shipping service subscribes to that event and triggers its processing. So it's using this notification hat. And it continues to look up your customer information from the, ship, from the customer service um, to work out where to send your parcel. The nice thing about this model is as soon as we move to events, suddenly the architecture is pluggable. Like if we have a stream of orders and a stream of payments and we want to create a service that does repricing, we don't have to change any of the other service, the services. The order service doesn't have to change. The payment service doesn't have to change. We can just plug things in. And you don't get this property in um, any request-driven model. We can also use this replication property that comes with events. So let's say we want to decouple even further. We could change the shipping service in the middle so that instead of calling the customer service, as it did previously, uh, oops, I've gone the wrong way. <laughs> so instead of calling the customer service as it did previously, um, we could instead replicate the changes to a database inside the shipping service and just use that database directly. Now, there's a couple of reasons we might want to do that. One, one reason is that we're, re we're like a really long way away. We're maybe in a, a different uh, region, or maybe we're up in the cloud, something like that, and the customer service is running on-premise. The other reason is that it gives us control of our data. So if we want the data in our database, so we want to do a join, or we want to manage our release cycle with less coupling, we don't have to want to have this, this real-time coupling with the customer service um, uh, at execution time we might do this replication. Um, it turns out stream processors actually do this. At least they offer you the ability to do this. And they do this for, for performance reasons. So if we rewrote the shipping service using the Kafka Streams API, we'd literally just use, we'd use Kafka Streams API. It's just an API which ships with Kafka. And we just use it to process an event, an, uh, an event stream coming from the order service. And we might just make that request to the customer service as we did originally. That would be stateless stream processing. There's no state involved. The application is completely stateless. It responds to events and looks up information in the customer service. We also might make it stateful. And if we made it stateful, we would use this concept of a K table. And we'd have the customer service would be our event source. The data would actually be stored in Kafka. And we would materialize a view inside our shipping service which allows us to do that lookup to say, give me the customer for this particular ID, all inside the stream processor. And the reason, main reason for doing this is it's just much, much faster, because you're actually calling um, basically an in-process database, um, which is typically largely in memory. So with this kind of model, you'll get maybe 50 to 100,000 events per second. With the previous model, you'll get maybe um, 10 to 100. So with streaming, stream, we're using something like a stream processing API. We can do either stateful or stateless operations. Stateless operations are basically purely on events. And if we want to do things with streams and tables and blend these things together, we're actually going to use these, these primitives which give us statefulness. So as we make these things a little bit more advanced, we can start to blend different primitives together. So in this case, we might actually have, we might have two streams. We have an order stream and a payment stream. And these are going to happen at about the same time. So we'd, use a, we'd actually represent them as streams of data. Like when you create an order, you probably create a payment at about the same time. It's an asynchronous system, so it could turn up in any order. But they're going to be temporally linked in some notion. And then we might also want to join to customer information, in which case we'd use this notion of a k-table. Um, we then run some code, which does whatever business logic our application needs, needs and um, we then output a result. So in code, this looks a bit like this. Um, it's simple, simplified slightly. So builder.stream orders basically gives us um, a stream of orders, which is coming from, let's say, the order service. We're going to join that with a payment service. So that means that only when both the order 
and the corresponding payment with a matching key arrive? Will it progress with the next step? We're also going to join to this customers table. So we would actually do a lookup in this local key value store um, to get our customer information and enrich further. So at this point, we're going to start doing a transformation. That just means run a bit of arbitrary code, which does something useful, effectively. Um, but the transform is actually going to be past a, a tuple, um, an enriched object, which, incl which includes the order, the payment, and the customer information, all tied together from these various different event sources, these various different microservices. So we can write any code that we want. And at the end of that, we would maybe output this to this shipments topic. So let's take um, a slightly richer example, um, which pulls all of these concepts together in a, in a single evolving ecosystem. Um, so firstly, we want to actually create some event sources. And let's imagine we're starting with like a monolithic um, application, a monolithic microservice application. So on the left-hand side, we've just got like a browser and a web server and a database, like nice, simple, monolithic system. So one way to create an event source is literally just to to go into the code of the web server and when somebody creates an, uh, an order, um, we'd still write it to the database, but we'd also send out this event, which other people can listen to. So order was received. And then we might create a new, new order service which is going to listen to that event. A very simple. And now, now we'll have an event source of orders. Another way to create an event source is from a database. This is actually pretty useful because you quite often already have data in databases. Um, so Kafka has a, uh, a thing called the Connect API. And um, this has a bunch of different connectors which source data from different places. So you might source data from something like a MQTT data source if you're doing IoT, um, or um, a variety of different other messaging systems, or actually many different databases. And there's a special type of connector which is called a change data capture connector. And these are pretty interesting because um, what they actually do is they attach themselves to the underlying transaction log of a database. So whilst, if we think back to that event sourcing example, whilst that database is typically just doing mutable state, it's taking updates and deletes and, 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 and mutating state as you write to it, the transaction log is actually keeping all of that information, all of those different updates, all of those different deletes. So if we use one of these CDC connectors, we're actually able to turn a mutable database into an immutable, immutable stream of events. And that's pretty interesting. Um, so with Kafka Connect, we can also do some, um, a single message transform. So that's like a rudimentary stream processor. It's like one event at a time stream processor. So we might like turn the database format into JSON or Avro or something like that, and then we put the data into Kafka. So thirdly, we can actually store these data sets inside the log. So in this case, we don't actually have to do anything. All we do is we just we tell, it, tell Kafka not to throw this information away after some period of time. So we would just maintain this inventory. But there's actually a special type of topic which is slightly better for storing data sets called a compacted topic. So with this information, uh, which is event, so this is the inventory, it really means just the um, uh, what stock we have in the warehouse. So let's say we have 1,000 pairs of trousers and 20,000 hats or whatever it might be. Um, so we're going to keep this data set in the log, and we're actually going to use that later. So next, next we can actually use joins um, to trigger our services from different correlated events. Um, this is a bit, a bit like the previous example. So let's add another service. We add a payment service. So we can call the payment service from the browser. Um, the browser would, would actually process, so the payment service would then process that payment and it would create an event inside Kafka, let's say payment created. So the order service would, could then join on uh, and trigger itself only when there is both a payment and an order present um, inside the order service. So we're totally event driven, but we're going to wait for this condition to be met. This is basically a logical end. Next, we're going to use this concept of a materialized view. And this is, um, this is so we can actually do some validation in our order service. So when you order a pair of trousers, the first thing you need to do inside the order service is check that there are actually enough trousers in stock. Um, and typically, you'll also have to reserve these items. 
um, so that uh, other people don't take them. So, the, what, so one way to do this is to use a k-table, and we can actually materialize um, the stock for each, uh, for each product um, inside our order service, inside this Streams API. And we're actually going to use that, that little um, database to store this information for us. Um, typically, we don't want to be too stateful. So we don't want to, want to materialize all the data if we don't have to. So we'll often trim this down to just the data that we need. So in the case of um, uh, checking whether, or not there are whether, or not whether there are enough items in stock, all we really need is the product ID. So like trousers might be product ID 52, and then the number of items in stock. So let's say we have 2,000 of them. So we might trim that down to uh, that minimal data set and store it in a k-table. So we can use this for, for some validation. Next, we're going to use this concept of a state store to act a bit like a little database, which we can do mutable operations in. Um, and the nice thing about this is it's going to be totally local to our order service. So we're going to run very quickly, fast, and in memory. Um, but it's also going to be backed up to Kafka. So if anything bad happens, it can always just be restored from the log. So when we do, um, when the order service actually validates the order, it needs to do a few different things. It needs to A, check that there's enough stock, there are enough pairs of trousers in stock. Um, it also then needs to reserve a pair of trousers. And before it reserves a pair of trousers, it also has to check that there weren't too many reserved before. So you've actually got like a simple bit of math where you do number of items in stock minus those that have been previously reserved. If there are enough, and I can actually fulfill the order, and I'm going to validate it, and I'm going to obviously reserve that item. So we can put that inside this state store. That state store operation will be, will be very, uh, obviously very fast, because it's local. And it will be backed up um, in Kafka. So we'll push this data back to Kafka. Next, we can actually complete this validation process. So inside our order service, Finally, we've actually done this validation process. We would actually create an order validated event. And we have a choice. We could store that in the same topic or a different topic. It's entirely up to us. And we can also link this back to the web server if we wanted to. So we actually, if you look at this whole workflow now, what you've actually got is an order is received, a payment's created. It gets pushed up to the order service, which does this relatively, com well, relatively complicated piece of validation. Then it creates a validated event. We can actually get the, the web server to also trigger um, on that event if we wanted to synthesize a, requ a uh, request response style operation um, with events. This is basically an implementation of the CQRS pattern. Um, the pattern is of, of, this, of collaborating with events in this way is called event collaboration. Uh, Martin Fowler wrote a pretty good article on this um, some time ago. So we can kind of link all this back round to the web server um, if we want to. So the final thing we need to do um, is actually add this concept of transactions. The stream processes uh, at Kafka offer you uh, transactional features. So if we look at inside this order service, we're actually doing quite a lot of different things. So we're, at, we're reading data from this inventory to tell us how much is in stock. We're also reading from this reserved K table. Um, we're also mutating this data in place. And actually, there's a whole bunch of stuff happening in the background, because we're reading from the payments topic, we're reading from the orders topic, we're committing offsets back to say how far we've got. There's a whole bunch of different things going on at the same time. So if we crashed pretty much at any point during this operation, we'd almost certainly get the wrong result when we started up again. Because we'd, yeah, we'd effectively be halfway through, so we'd end up reserving an extra item by mistake or whatever it might be. So we need to join these operations together, and we can do this um, with a transaction. Um, this is a very easy thing to implement in Kafka Streams. You just turn it on. That's all we have to do. Um, internally, people also tend to get a bit scared when you talk about the notion of a transaction. It's like, ooh, that sounds like that's going to be expensive. Um, well, basically, the way this works is there is a two-phase commit protocol. It's pretty much always a two-phase commit protocol inside um, any transaction. But the, the two-phase commit protocol happens, um, or is at least amortized, over a whole set of, of, of events. 
So you actually have like the, the, the way these work is actually very different to the way it works in a database. Um, you're actually passing marker messages through the stream, which denote the, the start and the end of a transaction. And um, basically, once the uh, a transaction across a set of messages completes, you would get this, this, this one two-phase commit protocol. But what this basically means is that we can, as we're streaming data through this kind of microservice uh, architecture, we're able to basically have these buffers of correctness and ensure that we can actually do these quite complicated operations. And the other interesting thing is that the, th the, the, the the stream processor is actually, it's, it's running across many, or normally across many different processes. So it might have three, five, 10 different instances of the order service running at the same time. Um, but we're actually going to run these on um, individual threads. So each, we're going to shard the data across these, well, just, this just ha happens automatically, across the different services. And each service is effectively running on a single thread. So we actually have a linearizable consistency model. Because for each operation, where it's operating on, a, it's, it's running inside a single thread, and it's also running inside a transaction. So we get this very um, nice, scalable, um, and linearizable um, operation. And the cost is amortized over the number of messages. So this actually works out um, pretty efficiently in practice. It wouldn't. You can imagine if you think about back to the Apple use case, um, nobody would use these things if they didn't go pretty fast. So the other question we have to think about is whether or not being stateful is a good idea. Right? I've just told you about a whole bunch of ways that you can basically make your application stateful. Um, there's lots of good reasons why you might not want to make your application stateful. Well, firstly, stream processes are pretty good at actually dealing with a stateful problem. That doesn't actually affect the original point, but it does help. So if you've got two versions of a, of a, of a service running, and one is got some, creating some state, that state will be replicated somewhere else, actually using the same event stream. So if one fails, the other one will just catch up a little bit, bit and then off it will go again, taking over the work from the original one. There's also some things like check disk checkpoints, which um, mean you don't have to reload data from Kafka all the time. There's compacted topics, um, reduce the data, size in, data set size in Kafka if you're storing data there. So a number of, sort of tricks for um, managing this problem of statefulness. But often, we actually just don't want to be stateful at all, particularly if we're doing like business operations. Like in a traditional application, you put your stateful problem in the database. You make your application there completely stateless, because it makes your life much easier. You can do exactly the same thing with a stream processor. It's just kind of the other way around. So you have the case, so let's say a case SQL layer, which is going to do all of your data operations, which you're going to join orders, payments, customers, all the stateful stuff inside this, uh, this stream processor. That creates a nice, big, fat, enriched event, which has all of the information that I need. And then you push that, put that into the next level. So in this case, we're going to do fraud detection. Now we've just got one event stream, no stateful operations, just one event stream. So our fraud service can scale in and out. We can deploy it without having to worry about um, it being stateful in any way, shape, or form. So finally, we can, uh, once we put these things together, we can then evolve and grow to richer architectures, pushing together Different, putting together different functions as we kind of um, make these systems more complex. Um, and they actually work pretty well at larger scales, too. So for example, um, we can have tiered bounded contexts, which um, span different departments. Um, we can also span different regions. And this is pretty interesting. So pretty common use cases to do something like extract an event source from something like a mainframe, and then stream that up to the cloud, where we can do something like fraud detection, stream it back down again. Um, and it even works in really sort of strange and disconnected places, like on ships, which are connected only by a satellite link. We won't get a high data use case through that, though, obviously. So summarizing, um, events let us decouple. That's the main reason that we tend to start using them. Um, they also record behavior. They tell us about what a user actually did or what a system actually did. Um, stream processes can be stateful. But they don't have to be. We can use these operations as we see fit. And if we, if we want to avoid statelessness, we just split the stateful and stateless operations and chain them together in this data flow model uh, with different elements of our topology. Um, so that was uh, kind of went through the sort of the, the, some of the core concepts. 
Um, if you like to play with the code, or maybe you'd like to play with this kind of system, um, there's actually a, a richer example. It's based on some of the things that I was talking about in this talk. So this is actually a, a simple implementation of CQRS, where you can do a post and a get. Um, and there's a little CQRS server, because that's command query responsibility segregation, if you haven't come across that term before. And it's actually going to spawn a bunch of validations which happen asynchronously in stream processes. So, the in, so it basically spawns it out, does, in this case, three validations which are running highly available, amalgamates all the data back, and you can, you can then um, fetch that information using a GET request. That inventory service is the thing that we were talking about um, previously, which is basically validating whether or not there's enough items in stock and does all those mutable operations um, all inside a stream processor. So there's code for this. You can play with it. It's obviously it's got tests and that kind of thing. You can also run it inside a Docker container. Um, and if you do that, there's a, it's, um, it actually boots up Confluent Control Center, so you can like play with the streams using KSQL and uh, push data into Elasticsearch. And there's some other services that send emails and do indexing and that kind of thing. So check it out. There's a blog at the top um, which kind of walks through how all this stuff works. And there's also, if you're really interested, um, a book which goes through a lot of the theory of these kind of things. And this is, um, this is free. You can just download it on the internet. It's called Designing Event-Driven Systems. Um, and it's about 150 pages long. And it sort of goes through all of the concepts of event-driven uh, design, event collaboration, event sourcing, um, and how we can build these um, systems in a more kind of practical way. Um, yes, well, look, thanks very much for taking the time. Um, it was really nice to get to speak to you all. And um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them if we have time. Thank you.